My name is Karen Neuror. I'm an associate professor and I do assessment and community outreach here at the Edmund Lowe Library. And I welcome you to this program today. I would like to recognize our co-sponsors and partners for today's program. Our co-sponsors are the Center for Oklahoma Studies, Women and Gender Studies, and the OSU Library. Our partners are the OSU History Department, the American Indians into Psychology Student Group, Alpha Pi Omega, the Native American Student Association, the Native American Faculty Staff Association, and the Center for American Indian Studies. And please join me in uh, a round of applause for all of our partners and sponsors. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Gary Sandifer. He is our Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, and he is a member of the Chickasaw Nation. Dr. Sandifer will introduce today's speaker. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and have a chance to uh, introduce our guest speaker. Um, our program is presented by a group of partners, as you just heard, and it's really nice to see different parts of the university working together uh, to make something like this happen. It is fitting that we are here in the Edmund Lowe Library, which is the intellectual heart of, the, of our campus. Programs such as today's are an important part of the university experience, and scholars like Dr. Dunbar Ortiz that challenge us to engage with information and ideas in ways that are new to many to think critically about the intersection of issues like race, gender, and class. Dr. Dunbar Ortiz is a native Oklahoman, historian, and a lifelong advocate for native rights. She holds a degree in history from San Francisco State College and completed her doctorate in history at the University of California, Los Angeles. She has taught Native American studies at California State University, where she also helped develop the Department of Ethnic Studies as well as Women's Studies. After years active in the anti-war movement, in 1974 she became active in the American Indian Movement at the International Indian Treaty Council, beginning a lifelong commitment to international human rights, including participating in the first international conference on Indians of the Americas at the United Nations headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland in 1977. Dr. Dunbar Ortiz has written several books related to Indians in the Americas, in addition to a trilogy memoir covering her years growing up in Oklahoma. Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki, her time as an anti-war activist and organizer, Outlaw Woman, a memoir of the war years, 1960 to 1975, and her time chronicling the Contra War in Nicaragua in the 1980s, Blood on the Border, a memoir of the Contra War. Today she will be discussing her latest work, and I'm sure it's not her last given her prolific uh, outpouring over the years, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. This work challenges the founding myth of the United States and sheds light on the destructive policies aimed at the Indigenous people in this country. So, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz. Is this the microphone? This is it. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sedefer and uh, Provost and uh, Karen and all of the co-sponsors and partners. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's, I was here, I've been here a couple of times to the library and I'm, uh, I'm uh, so impressed with the special collections and the, uh, the people I, I know here uh, that I decided to leave my archive here, so you can. <laughs> and so it's a special treat um, to tell you about this uh, new book. I, I am a historian, and it is a history of the United States. Uh, it's uh, from the indigenous people's perspective. It's a little uh, tricky. Uh, it's sort of based on the template of uh, Howard Zinn's People's History, people, a, a people, 
people's history of the United States. Um, I, uh, Howard Zinn was a friend, longtime friend. The book came out in 1980 from Beacon Press. And I was always critical of him. He, he really paid, you know, the for opening chapter is, uh, is profound and moving and, you know, was documented like no other history text at the time even came close to about the tragic consequences of U.S. colonialism uh, in um, the initial uh, invasion uh, during the colonial period. And um, then uh, he picks up the story of Native people again sort of during the Jackson era, a few chapters more, and then kind of jumps to 1890 and the uh, massacre at Wounded Knee and the end of Native uh, armed resistance to, um, to um, being occupied. And so I would always say, well, Howard, where were, oh, and then his contemporary chapter, he it's Alcatraz, but there's nothing between 1890 and 1969. I said, what, what happened to the Indians? Were they hibernating or, you know, so he would say, you need to write that book, Roxanne. And so before he passed away, he actually went to Beacon Press and suggested to them that they asked me to write that book. And they called me up and asked me if I'd be interested in writing precisely that title. So Howard died before, three years before I finished. And there were times when I wished that I could, uh, you know, strangle him for having ever <laughs> suggested this. It was, it was a difficult, very difficult book, the most difficult book I've ever written. Because uh, we wanted it to be accessible to many audiences, a general reading audience, um, but also be use, usable as a text or a supplementary text in college or even in high schools and not be too long and not be too um, academic in language uh, and, and to be well written. Uh, so I worked on it long and hard. Today I wanted to share with you, some of you may have read the book um, and you will remember um, chapter one. I, I, it's called Follow the Corn and it's um, the pre-colonial chapter. I felt that uh, there was no way, I say, you know, this, this is like 100,000 years of history and 200 pages. There was no way to really write uh, about the, um, what happens in U.S. history uh, with Native people, but what was lost, what was there and what was lost, that it's so important to ground the whole text in that. So I'll, I'll, read, um, I'll read from chapter one. As a birthplace of agriculture and the towns and the cities that followed, America is ancient, not a new world. Domestication of plants took place around the globe in seven locales during approximately the same period, around 8500 BC. Three of the seven were in the Americas. Mesoamerica, Central America, Central Mexico, the South American Andes in South America, and the Eastern part of North America, east of the Mississippi. The other early agricultural centers were the Tigris, Euphrates, and Nile systems, the Sub-Saharan Africa, the Yellow River of Northern China and the Yantes River of Southern China. During this time, many of the same human societies began domesticating animals. Only in the American continents was the parallel domestication of animals eschewed in favor of game management, a kind of animal husbandry different from that developed in Africa and Asia and with important consequences, uh, I think, for the societies that were formed. In these seven areas, agriculture-based civil, civilized societies, in quote, 
developed in symbiosis with hunting, fishing, and gathering peoples on their peripheries, like the rest of the world, gradually enveloping many of the latter into the realms of their civilizations, except for those in regions inhospitable to agriculture or those um, uh, in fishing societies along uh, the coastal, the long, long coastal ways of the Atlantic and the Pacific. Indigenous American agriculture was based on corn, uniquely in the world. Traces of cultivated corn have been identified in central Mexico dating back 10,000 years. 12 to 14 centuries later, corn production had spread throughout the temperate and tropical Americas from the southern tip of South America to the subarctic of North America and from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> on both continents. The wild grain from which corn was cultivated has never been identified with certainty. But the indigenous peoples for whom the corn was and is their sustenance believe it was a sacred gift from their gods. Since there is no evidence of corn on any other continent prior to the po its post-Columbian dispersal, its development is a unique invention of the original American agriculturalists and one of the most nutritious grains in the world. Corn cannot grow wild and cannot exist without attentive human care. Along with multiple varieties and colors of corn, some 90 to 100, Mesoamericans cultivated squash and beans in almost that many colors and, and, um, and styles, each of them with different compositions of vitamins and minerals and nutritions. And these two were extended throughout the hemisphere as were the many varieties and co colors of potato, the potato initiated, initially cultivated by Andean farmers beginning more than 7,000 years ago. Corn, being a summer crop, can tolerate no more than 20 to 30 days without water, and even less time in high temperatures. Many of the areas where corn was the staple were and are semi-arid, so its cultivation required the design and construction of complex irrigation systems in place at least 2,000 years before Europeans knew the Americas existed. The proliferation of agriculture and cultigens could not have occurred without centuries of cultural and, econ and, co and commercial interchange among the peoples of North, Central, and South America, whose traders carried seeds as well as other goods and cultural practices. The vast reach and capacity of indigenous grain production impressed colonialist Europeans. A traveler in French-occupied North America related in 1669 that six square miles of cornfields surrounded each Iroquois village. The governor of New France, following a military raid in, 18, in, 16, in the 1680s, reported that he had destroyed more than a million bushels, 42,000 tons of corn, belonging to four Iroquois villages. Thanks to the nutritious triad of corn, beans, and squash, which provided, provide a complete protein, the Americas were densely populated when the European monarchies began sponsoring colonization projects here. The total population of the hemisphere was about 100 million at the end of the 50, 15th century, with about two-fifths in North America, including Mexico. Central Mexico alone supported some 30 million people. At the same time, the population of Europe as far east as the Ural Mountains was about 50 million. Experts have observed that such population densities in pre-colonial America were supportable because it was a relatively disease-free paradise. This is the, what I call the master narrative, the new master narrative. There certainly were diseases, though, and health problems, 
But the practices of herbal medicine and even surgery and dentistry, and most importantly, both hygienic and ritual bathing, kept diseases at bay. Settler observers in all parts of the Americas marveled at the frequent bathing, even in winter, in cold climates. One commented that the native people, quote, go to the river and plunge in and wash themselves before they dress daily, which they found very weird because they never bathed and they had a lot of diseases. <laughs> Another wrote, quote, men, women, and children from early infancy are in the habit of bathing. Ritual sweat baths were common to all native North Americans having originated in Mexico. Above all, the majority of indigenous peoples of the Americans had healthy, mostly vegetarian diets based on the staple of corn and supplemented by wild fish, fowl, and four-legged animals. People lived long and well with abundant ceremonial and recreational periods. As one of the two other major continental land masses, Eurasia and Africa, civilization in the Americas emerged from certain population centers with periods of vigorous growth and integration interspersed with periods of decline and disintegration. At least a dozen such centers were functioning in the Americas when the Europeans arrived. Although this is a history, this book is a history of the part of North America that is today the United States, it is important to follow the corn to its origins and consider the people's history of the Valley of Mexico and Central America, often called Mesoamerica. Influences from the South powerfully shaped the indigenous peoples to the North in what is now the United States, and Mexicans continue today to migrate as they have for millennium but now across the arbitrary border that was established in the U.S. war against Mexico in 1846-48. So I do have a rather long portion about Mexico that um, if you haven't read it, it will be a tease. You have to, you have to get the book to read. <laughs> The economic basis for the powerful Aztec state, which most of you know about is you know, the history of, of Mexico that was overthrown by Cortes. Its uh, economic base was hydraulic agriculture with corn as the central crop. Beans, pumpkins, tomatoes, cocoa, and many other food crops flourished and supported a dense population, much, much of it concentrated in large urban centers cities larger than European cities. The Aztecs also grew tobacco and cotton, the latter providing the fiber for all cloth and clothing. Tobacco was used ceremonially. Weaving and metalwork flourished, providing useful commodities as well as works of art. Building techniques enabled construction of enormous stone dams and canals as well as fortress-like castles made of brick or stone. There were elaborate markers in each city and a far-flung trade network that used routes established by the previous uh, dominance of the, of the Toltec nation. Aztec merchants acquired turquoise from Pueblo, Pueblos um, who, who mined, uh, mined it in what is now the U.S. Southwest to sell in central Mexico, where it had become the most valued of all material possessions and was used as a means of exchange or a form of money. 65,000 turquoise artifacts in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, are evidence of the importance of, the, of turquoise as a major pre-colonial commodity. Other items were also valuable, marketable commodities in the area, salt being close to turquoise in value. Ceramic trade goods involved interconnected markets from Mexico City to Mesa Verde, Colorado. Shells from the Gulf of California, tropical bird feathers from the Gulf Coast of Mexico, obsidian from Durango, Mexico, and flint from Texas were all found in the ruins of Casa Grande, Arizona, the commercial center of the northern frontier of central Mexico. Turquoise functioning as money was traded to acquire macaw 
and parrot feathers from tropical areas for religious rituals, seashells from coastal peoples, and hides and meat from the northern plains. The stone has been found in pre-colonial sites in Texas, Kansas, and Nebraska, where the Wichita's served as intermediaries carrying turquoise and other goods farther east, right across where we are, um, farther east and north. Crees in the Lake Superior region and communities in what is today Ontario, Canada, and in today's Wisconsin acquired turquoise through trade. Traders from Mexico were also transmitters of culture and features such as the Sundance religion in the Great Plains and the co cultivation of corn by the Algonquin, Cherokee, Muscogee Creek peoples of the eastern half of North America. These were transmitted from Central America. The oral and written histories of the Aztecs, Cherokees, and Choctaws record these relations. Cherokee oral history tells of their ancestors' migrations from the south and through Mexico, as does Muscogee history. Although the Aztecs were apparently flourishing culturally and economically, as well as being militarily and politically strong, their dominance was declining on the eve of Spanish intrusion. Being pressed for tribute through violent attacks, peasants rebelled and there were uprisings all over Mexico. Montezuma II, who came to power in 1503, might have succeeded in his attempt to reform the regime, but the Spanish overthrew him uh, before he had the opportunity. And of course, the Spanish Cortes had allied with these rebellious uh, peoples all over Mexico. The Mexican state was crushed and its cities leveled in Cortes's three-year genocidal war. Cortez's recruitment of resistant communities all over Mexico as allies aided in the toppling of the central regime. Cortez and his 200 European mercenaries could never have overthrown the Mexican state without the indigenous insurgency he co-opted. Uh, I make this point because throughout the book I show that this is how colonialism works. It does have to uh, partner with uh, locals, whether it's the Raj in India or you know, uh, native elites in different parts of the Americas. The resistant peoples who allied with Cortez to overthrow the oppressive Aztec regime could not yet have known the goals of the gold-obsessed gold, gold Spanish colonizers or the European institutions that backed them. Uh, in chapter two, I go through those European institutions that were developed over a period of eight centuries uh, in Europe the, the Crusades the, and the, re, the conquest of Spain, driving uh, the Muslims out, and in England, the conquest of Ireland. So they, they had their colonial institutions intact when they came to the Americas. What is now the U.S. Southwest, once formed with today's Mexican state of, states of Sonora, Sinaloa, and Chihuahua, the northern periphery of the Aztec regime in the Valley of Mexico. Mostly an alpine and semi-arid region cut with rivers, it is a fragile land base with rainfall, a scarcer com commodity, um, and drought endemic. Yet in the Sonora Desert of present-day southern Arizona, communities were practicing agriculture by 2100 BC and began digging irrigation canals as early as 1250 BC. The earliest evidence of corn in the area dates from 2000 BC, introduced by trade and migration between north and south. Farther north, people began cultivating corn, beans, squash, and cotton around 1500 BC. Their descendants, um, the, um, the Odom uh, people, call their ancestors the Huhugam, meaning those who have gone, which English speakers have re rendered Hohokam. Ho the Hohokam people left behind ball courts similar to those of the Mayans, multi-story buildings, and agricultural fields. Their most striking imprint on the land is one of the most extensive networks of irrigation canals in the world at that time. From AD 900 to 1459, just the eve of the um, invasion, the Spanish invasion, 
The Hohokams built a canal system more than 800 miles of trunk lines and hundreds more miles of branches serving local sites. The longest known canal extended 20 miles. The largest were 75 to 85 feet in diameter and 20 feet deep and many were leak-proof, lined with clay. One canal system carried enough water to irrigate an estimated 10,000 acres. Hohokam farmers grew surplus crops for export, and their community became a crossroads in a trade route reaching from Mexico to Utah, and uh, from Utah uh, to the Pacific Coast, and down to Mexico, and out to the Great Plains. By the 14th century, Hohokams had dispersed, living in smaller communities. The famed people that anthropologists call Anasazi of Chaco Canyon on the Colorado Plateau in the present day Four Corners region of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah thrived from 850 to 1250 AD. Ancestors of the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico, the Anasazi constructed more than 400 miles of roads radi radiating out from Chaco. Averaging 30 feet wide, these roads followed straight courses even through difficult terrain such as hills and rock formations. The highways connected some 75 communities. Around the 13th century, the Anasazi people abandoned Chaco and, and migrated, building nearly 100 smaller agricultural city-states along the northern Rio Grande Valley, 19 of which still exist today, and its tributaries. Northernmost Taos Pueblo was an important trade center, handling buffalo products from the plains, tropical bird feathers, copper and shells from Mexico, and turquoise from New Mexico mines. Pueblo trade extended as far west as the Pacific Ocean, as far east as the Great Plains, and as far south as Central America. From the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River, south to the Gulf of Mexico lay one of the most fertile agricultural belts in the world, crisscrossed with great rivers, naturally watered, teeming with plant and animal life, temperate and climate, the region was home to multiple agricultural nations. In the 12th century, the Mississippi Valley region was marked by one enormous city-state, Cahokia, and several larger ones built of earthen stepped pyramids, much like those in Mexico. Cahokia supported a population of tens of thousands, larger than that of London during the same period. Other architectural monuments were sculpted in the shape of gigantic birds, lizards, bears, alligators, and even a 1,300-foot-long serpent. These feats of monumental construction testified to the levels of civic and social organization and leisure as well, that uh, something that's useless, you know, seemingly useless, that's called art, right, <laughs> is produced called mound builders by European settlers. The people of this civilization had dispersed before the European invasion, but their influence had spread throughout the eastern half of North American continent through cultural influence and trade. What European colonizers found in the southeastern region of the continent were nations of villages with economies based on agriculture and corn, the mainstay. This was the territory of the nations of the Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Choctaw, and the Muscogee Creek and Seminole, along with the Natchez Nation at the western part um, in the Mississippi Valley region. Um, I did Latin American history, so I studied then. I knew that uh, the Natchez Nation was um, disappeared by Spanish, uh, Spanish using it as a, a, to deport uh, the native people as slaves to the mines in Peru. So they really were on the, the transatlantic voyage. They went down the tip of South America and around to Peru. So they, it's always said that they just died off, but they didn't die off. They, they were enslaved like West Africans were enslaved. Uh, the first century of Spanish colonialism, uh, Indian slavery was the main form of uh, slavery. 
To the north, a remarkable federal state structure, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, often referred to as the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, was made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk nations, and from early in the 19th century, the Tuscaroras. This system incorporated six widely dispersed and unique nations of thousands of agricultural villages, different languages, and hunting grounds from the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic, and as far south as to the Carolinas and inland to Pennsylvania. The Haudenosaunee peoples avoided centralized power by means of a clan village system of democracy based on collective stewardship of the land. Corn, the staple crop, was, um, was stored in granaries and distributed equitably in this matrilineal society by the clan mothers, the oldest women from every extended family. Many other nations flourished in the Great Lakes region, where now the U.S.-Canadian border uh, cuts through their realms, among them the Anishinaabe, called by others Ojibwe or Chippewa, was the largest. The peoples of the prairies of Central North America spanned an expanse of space from West Texas to the subarctic between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Several centers of development in that vast region of farming and bison-dependent bison peoples may be identified. In the prairies of Canada, the Crees, and the Dakotas, the Lakota, Dakota Sioux, and to their west and south, the Cheyenne Arapaho peoples, Farther south were the Ponca, Pawnee, Osage, Kiowa, many other nations, with Buffalo numbering 60 million. Territorial disputes inevitably occurred, and diplomatic skills as well as trade were highly developed for conflict resolution. In the Pacific Northwest, from present-day Alaska to San Francisco and along the vast inland waterways to the mountain barriers, great seafaring and fishing peoples flourished, linked by culture, common ceremonies, and extensive trade. These were wealthy people living in a comparative paradise of natural resources, including the sacred salmon. They invented the potlatch, the ceremonial distribution of dis or destruction of accumulated goods, creating a, a culture of reciprocity. They crafted gigantic wooden totems, masts, and lodges carved from giant sequoias, redwoods, and cedars. Among, the, uh, among these communities speaking many languages were the Tlingit people of Alaska, the salmon fishing, Salish, Maka, Hoopa, Poma, Karak, and Yurok peoples. The territory between the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountains in the West, now called the Great Basin, was a harsh environment that supported small populations before European colonization, as it does today. Yet the Shoshone, Bannock, Paiute, and Ute peoples there managed the environment and built permanent villages. Every inch of, America, of the Americas were occupied. Uh, by people who were stewards of that part of the land. Each indigenous nation or city-state or town in North America comprised an independent, self-governing people that held supreme authority over affairs and dealt with other peoples on equal footing through diplomacy. Among the factors that integrated each nation, in addition to language, were shared belief systems and rituals and clans of extended families that spanned more than one town. Not all native peoples had clans, like the Lakota, Dakota, the, many of the Plains people didn't use the clan system. The system of decision making uh, was based on consensus in, you know, some kind of consensus in, in uh, all these different governmental forms, uh, but never majority rule. This form of decision making later baffled colonial agents who could not find indigenous officials to bribe or manipulate. In terms of inter international diplomacy, each of the indigenous peoples of Western North America was a sovereign nation. First, the Spanish, French, and British colonizers, and then the US colonizers made treaties with these indigenous governments. Indiv indigenous governance varied widely in form. East of the Mississippi River, towns and federations of towns were governed by family lineages. 
the male el elder of the most powerful clan was the executive. His accession to that position and all his decisions were subject to the approval of a council of elders of the clans that were represented in the town. In this manner, the town had sovereign authority over its internal affairs. In each sovereign town burned a sacred fire symbolizing its relationship with the spirit beings. English colonists termed such groupings of towns confederacies or federations. The Haudenosaunee people today retain a fully functioning government of this type. It was a Haudenosaunee constitution called the Great Law of Peace that inspired essential elements of the U.S. Constitution. Orrin Lyons, who holds the title of Faith Keeper of the Turtle Clan and is a member of the Onondaga Council of Chiefs, explains the essence of that constitution. The first principle is peace. The second principle, equity, justice for the people. And the third, the power of the good minds at the collective powers to be of one mind and unity. And health, he adds. All of these were involved in the basic principles. And the process of discussion, putting aside warfare as a method of reaching decisions now instead using the intellect. Muskogee Creek, Seminoles, um, the Muskogees, Creeks and Seminoles, and other peoples in the Southeast had, these, had three branches of government, a civil administration, a military, and a, a branch that dealt with the sacred. The leaders of each of these branches were drawn from the elite, and other officials were drawn from prominent clans. Over the centuries, Preceding European colonization, ancient traditions of diplomacy had developed among the indigenous nations. Societies in the eastern part of the continent had an elaborate ceremonial structure for di diplomatic meetings among representatives of disparate governments and cultures. In the federations of sovereign towns, the leading towns, fire, represented the entire group, and each member town sent a representative or two to the Federation's council. Thus, everyone in the Federation was represented in the government's decision-making. Agreements reached in such meetings were considered sacred pledges that the representatives made not only to one another, but also to powerful spirits looking on. So uh, the nations tended to do, to hold firm to such treaties out of respect for the sacred power that was a uh, party to the agreements. Relations with the spirit world were thus a major factor in government. So later, you know, when the European nations made treaties, this was the uh, attitude of the native people. These were sacred uh, agreements. And when they were broken, um, it was uh, baffling because it could never, uh, it was never supposed to happen. The roles of women varied among the societies of Eastern North America. Among the Muskogees and other Southern nations, women uh, did not participate that much in, in governmental affairs. But in Haudenosaunee, and they were mostly the agriculturalists and architects, the builders of, of the villages, the women. But um, the, among the Haudenosaunee uh, and Cherokee, the women held more political authority. Among the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, and Tuscaroras, certain female lineages controlled the choice of male representatives for their clans in their governing councils. Men were the representatives, but the women who chose them had the right to speak in council, and when the chosen representative was too young or inexperienced to be effective, one of the women might participate in the council on his behalf. Haudenosaunee clan mothers held the power to recall unsatisfactory representatives. Charles C. Mann, author of um, 1491, which I highly recommend, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus, calls this system a feminist dream. Men doing everything the women told them to do. <laughs> According to the value system that drove consensus building and decision making in these societies, the community's interests overrode individual interests. 
So by the time of European invasions, indigenous peoples had occupied and shaped every part of the Americas, established extensive trade networks and roads, and were sustaining their populations by adopt, uh, adapting to specific natural environments. But they were also adapting nature to suit human needs. Indigenous peoples used fire to tame, to shape and tame the pre-colonial North American landscape. In the Northeast, indigenous farmers always carried flints. They also used torches for uh, night hunting and rings of flame to encircle animals. Rather than domesticating animals for hides and meat, indigenous communities created havens to attract elk, deer, bear, and other game. They burned the undergrowth in the forest so that the young grasses and other ground cover that sprouted the following spring would entice greater numbers of herbivores and the predators that fed on them, which would sustain the people who consumed them both. Rather than the thick, unbroken, monumental snarl of trees imagined by Thoreau, the Great Eastern Forest was an ecological kaleidoscope of garden plots, blackberry brambles, pine barrens, and spacious groves of chestnut, hickory, and oak. Inland, a few miles from the shore, present-day Rhode Island, an er early European explorer marveled at the trees that were spaced so, so that the forest could be penetrated by a large army, he reported back. You can see what the uh, motive was there. Uh, English mercenary John Smith wrote that he had ridden a galloping horse through the Virginia forest. In Ohio, the first English squatters on indigenous lands in the mid 18th century encountered forested areas that resembled English parks as they, as they could drive carriages through the trees. Bison herds roamed the east from New York to Georgia. It's no accident that a settler city in western New York was named Buffalo. The American bison was indigenous to the northern and southern plains of North America, not the east. Yet native peoples imported them east along a path of fire as they transformed the forest into fallows for the bison to survive on far from their original habitat. Historian William Cronin has written that when the Haudenosaunee hunted buffalo, they were harvesting a foodstuff which they had consciously been instrumental in creating. So this is what I meant by, um, by uh, uh, not domesticating animals, but game management. As for the great American desert, as Anglo-Americans called the Great Plains, the occupants transformed that too into game farms. Using fire, they extended the giant grasslands and maintained them. When Lewis and Clark began their trek up the Missouri River in 1804, they beheld not a wilderness, but a vast pasture managed by and for Native Americans. Native Americans created the world's largest gardens and grazing lands and thrived. Native peoples left an indelible imprint on the land with systems of roads that had tied the nations and communities together across the entire landmass of the Americas. Roads were developed along rivers and many indigenous roads in North America track the Mississippi, Ohio, Missouri, Columbia, and Colorado rivers, the Rio Grande, and other major streams. Roads also followed sea coasts. A major road ran along the Pacific coast from northern Alaska, where travelers could continue by boat to Siberia, south to an urban area in western Mexico. A branch of that road, that's now the Pan American Highway, a lot of, well, is the Pan American Highway. A branch of that road ran through the Sonora Desert and up onto the Colorado Plateau, serving ancient towns and later communities such as the Hopis and Pueblos of the Northern Rio Grande. From the Pueblo communities, roads eastward carried travelers onto the semi-arid plains along tributaries of the Pecos River and up to the communities in what is now eastern New Mexico, the Texas Panhandle, and West Texas. There were also roads from the northern Rio Grande to the southern plains of western Oklahoma. 
by way of the Canadian and Cimarron rivers. The roads along those rivers and their tributaries led to a system of roads that followed, uh, followed rivers from the southeast. They also connected with, one, with roads that turned southward toward the Valley of Mexico. The eastern roads connected Muscogee Creek towns in present-day Georgia and Alabama. From the Muscogee towns, a major road led north through Cherokee territory, the Cumberland Gap, and the Shenandoah Valley region to the confluence of the Ohio and the Skelto rivers. From that northeastern part of the continent, a traveler could reach the west coast by following roads along the Ohio River to the Mississippi, up the Mississippi, to the mouth of the Missouri, and along the Missouri westward to the headwaters. From there, a road crossed the Rocky Mountains through South Pass in present-day Wyoming and led to the Columbia River. The Columbia River led to the large population, a large population center at the river's mouth on the Pacific Ocean and connected with that Pacific Coast Road. So these, uh, <clears throat> one um, scholar has observed that the first thing to note about early Native American roads is that they were not just paths in the woods following animal tracks used mainly for burning, uh, for hunting. Neither can they be characterized simply as routes that nomadic peoples followed during seasonal migrations. Rather, they constructed an extensive system of roadways that spanned the Americas, making possible short, medium, and long distance travel. That is to say, the pre-Columbian Americas were laced together with a complex system of roads and paths which became the roadways adopted by the early settlers and indeed were um, ultimately transformed into the major highways that exist today. skipping around a little bit. Um, so I finish with this. Uh, North America in 1492 was not a virgin forest, but a network of indigenous nations, people, the peoples of the corn. The link between peoples of the North and South can be seen in the diffusion of corn from Mesoamerica. Both Muscogees and Cherokees, whose orig original ha homelands in North America are located in the southeast, trace their lineage to migrations from or through Mexico. Cherokee historian uh, Emmett Starr wrote, the Cherokees most probably preceded by several hundred years the Muscogees in their exodus from Mexico and swung in a wider circle, crossing the Mississippi River many miles north of the mouth of the Missouri River, as indicated by the mounds. <clears throat> Another Cherokee writer, Robert Conley, tells about the oral tradition that claimed Cherokee origins in South America and subsequent migrations through Mexico. Later, with U.S. military invasion relocation of the Muscogee the Muscogee and Cherokee peoples, many groups split off and sought refuge in Mexico, as did others under pressure, such as the Kickapoos. Although practiced traditionally throughout the indigenous uh, agricultural areas of North America, the green corn dance remains strongest among the Muscogee people. The elements of the ritual dance are similar to those in the Valley of Mexico. Although the dance takes various forms among different communities, the core of it is the same, a commemoration of the gift of corn by an ancestral corn woman. The peoples of the corn retain great affinities under the crust of colonialism. This brief overview of pre-colonial North America suggests the magnitude of what was lost to all humanity and counteracts the settler colonial myth of the wandering Neolithic hunter. These were civilizations based on advanced agriculture and featuring um, serious uh, governance. It is essential to understand the migrations and indigenous people's relationships to one another prior to invasion, north and south, and how colonialism cut them off from each other. But, the relationships are being reestablished today. Thank you.